Well, hello and welcome. My name is Chris Tanner and uh, we're excited for today's webinar. Uh, you know, kind of as a background, uh, we have a lot of folks, a lot of clients who come to us and they're wanting to invest in private offerings and private opportunities. And I think a lot of clients uh, like myself, you know, we're not experts. We don't have the background to do a lot of research and due diligence. Uh, into, you know, well, how do we know if this is a good deal or where I should do a little more digging? And so uh, we have asked a uh, gentleman, uh, Mr. Bruce Roberts, who I'll introduce here in just a bit, to kind of share some of his thoughts and get a professional's opinion on how they would evaluate uh, private equity type investments. And so with all webinars, we have to start uh, by sharing the uh, safe harbor statement. And basically, this is just saying that New Direction Trust does not provide any investments. Uh, we don't provide any financial advice or any uh, tax uh, strategies or advice as well. So today's webinar really is just meant to be for educational purposes only. And so anything that you glean from today's webinar, we would encourage you to seek your own personal advice with a trusted consultant. Uh, that you would be working with. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with New Direction Trust Company, uh, just kind of a quick background. Uh, we're a company that was established a little over 20 years ago, and New Direction Trust Company is a unique company in that we work primarily with qualified retirement plans. So anything that you would you know, put in the category of a retirement plan, uh, and what we do is we allow our clients to invest in a wide variety of assets. So most retirement plans, of course, are focused on the stock market. And what our retirement plans allow people to do is invest outside of the stock stock market. So it could be things like private equity, real estate, precious metals, really a whole variety of things. Uh, and it's something that they are in charge of. And so when you hear the word self-directed IRA, that is in fact what these accounts are because we are not obviously providing investments or giving any advice. Uh, just as a quick introduction, my name's Chris Tanner. I'm the Senior Sales and Education Manager at uh, New Direction Trust. So I've been in this field for 11 years um, and Beyond that, 11 years helping folks, but I've been actually self-directing since 2006. And so this is a topic that I, uh, I know our clients will be interested in. And so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Bruce. Well, Bruce, uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing terrific. It's, uh, it's a pretty day in North Carolina where I happen to be sitting. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, we're excited to have you. Uh, and we appreciate you taking some time to offer your expertise. So yeah, tell us just a little bit about yourself so we can get to know you. Sure, um, I'm a career investment banker. Uh, started in the industry after leaving the Navy in 1984 at the old Bank of America. That was in San Francisco at the time before it got acquired by Nations Bank. Uh, I have been an investment banker when I started my career uh, fledgling investment banker at, at Bank of America, and then ended up not too long after that, a few years later, in New York at what was First Boston Corporation. And First Boston uh, evolved to become Credit Suisse. And my background as an investment banker uh, has always been around capital raising. Um, investment banking is a field where there's many different disciplines within it. Uh, you can be a merger and acquisition expert. You can be an analyst for equity research. It just kind of goes on and on. And within that, there are folks like I was there anyway, and still am here at Carafin that focus on raising capital for companies. Uh, in the case of Carafin, we're, we by nature have to be generalists as it relates to capital raising. So we finance both debt and equity, and we fall in the small to medium business space, the SMB space, and have, since I founded the firm in 1995, so next year's our 30th year anniversary, so time plus when you're, when you're having fun, um, we have raised over a billion dollars of, of private debt and equity, and somewhat unusually, unusual, we uh, place those securities 
with either a high net worth individuals, uh, the type who often would have a self-directed IRA. And in some cases, we've done quite a bit of business with uh, clients of New Direction um, and, and where they have taken funds, allocated funds from their trust account, uh, self-directed IRA rather, uh, into transactions that we would bring. Um, we also work with family offices um, and then we work with institutions. And the latter part of that, the institutional side is consistent with what I did in New York. Um, I was doing relatively large transactions, $100 million plus transactions, um, even back in the in the 90s. <laughs> um, and that institutional discipline that we had in New York at that firm, and first boss at the time is one of six we called the special bracket who dominated capital markets for, for, for corporate entities. We brought that to the small to medium business space and have evolved it over the years. And um, this is a great pleasure for me to to begin to, to present at least one of the um, guidelines that I've created actually for our own use. Uh, we're seeing transactions day in, day out, and we always needed, um, I always felt we needed some sort of a guideline to get a general understanding of the fundamentals of a business uh, as an efficiency to ourselves. And, you know, as it turns out, everything that that I've learned and am creating for our own staff to, to grow with uh, are applicable to our investors, to our customers. And so we make those available on our website, carefin.com, in the knowledge base. And you might be surprised if you go there, if you go to carefin.com and click knowledge base, I think it's probably the largest repository that I know of, of information that provide uh, some guidelines for how you do private investing. And you know, it, it's it's always it still strikes me odd all these years later. This is kind of the wild west of finance. Um, when you look at an institutional debt deal, let's say, well, by and large, that deal is going to have credit ratings on it from Standard and Poor, Standard and Poor's, Moody's, or Fitch. If you look at an equity, and there, and that's going to be professionals who are evaluating that deal, putting a uh, a rating on it, and that gives you a running start as to what the where that credit sort of falls in the spectrum of, of you know, triple A to, you know, C, right, let's call it. Um, if you're looking at an equity offering in the institutional market, well, you got equity research. And likewise, um, you'll be able to leverage the expertise, often the industry expertise of equity analysts who do that. When you get to the private investment market, um, well, forget it. I mean, there are no guardrails that I know of. Um, the, the the financials aren't generally speaking aren't even expected to be, you know, gap accounting standards, um, and so where do you start? And and the the presentation we'll do today will give you a starting point. I want to emphasize this is not the end point. Uh, what this is going to do is allow you to do a quick sanity check on something that may be crossing your desk to figure out do I want to keep looking or do I want to move on? And it also Oddly, what happens often when you when you're confronted with a, a company that needs capital, and, and make no mistake, the the world of the banking industry, the commercial banking industry, whereby the local banker was making underwriting decisions and knew all the people in town and could make that call and had the responsibility and the authority to make a loan, those days by and large are gone. Uh, with consolidation of banking, uh, the part of our economy that's really suffered has been the small to medium business. Now. For those of you who are inclined to look in this market, well, one, you're incented to do so because you should get a higher return than you would get in the public markets for two reasons. One, it's not liquid. These are buy and hold securities. But two, as I said, um, you're, you're having to make your own call in terms of the credit quality. And so, um, you know, that obviously puts you at risk as well. So the illiquidity and the general openness, if you will, of how things are disclosed. So I'm hoping this will give you somewhat of a, of a starting point. And then, you know, perhaps at some point, Chris, we can we can drill a little bit deeper into equity specific conversations and debt specific conversations. But uh, I think in terms of understanding, you know, what's this this enterprise that I'm looking at and do I want to continue to explore it or I just want to turn the page and move on to another one? That's kind of the, the goal of this presentation. Yeah, and that makes sense. And I don't think most people have the banking background or the know how to even understand where do I start? And so we definitely appreciate this and and I get it. This this would be a good screening criteria to say, should I dig deeper or just move on? Uh, and that absolutely makes sense. And well, and and I, and I would 
really encourage people to um, to to make the commitment to look into this seriously as part of their portfolio. Uh, I guess I should say in any scenario, you should always strive for diversity. So you never want to put too much of your funds in any one deal. That's the case in virtually any investment category I can think of, but it is doubly the case when it comes to private investment. So uh, no matter how attractive you think a transaction is, um, come up with the lowest amount that you can put in that's meaningful to your account and make that one investment and then build on that portfolio. And if you have consistency in your methodology, then on balance, you know, you, you should do well by this. But the uh, the returns on the, these deals fall basically in two categories, either current income related. Um, so they should be paying you an outsized return from what you could get in the public market. So as we speak, I think money markets are probably around a 5% sort of a rate, which means in this environment, you ought to be getting somewhere between 12 to 15%. I would caution you, if there's too high an interest rate on a deal, you have to ask yourself, what kind of company can afford to pay that interest rate? Because just normally, so it, it doesn't necessarily follow that as rates go up, these go up lockstep. There's kind of a practical limitation. If it's equity, particularly if it's venture equity, venture equity being defined as the company has not yet achieved positive cash flow, um, well, then you ought to be in for a long ride. Um, one of the most um, successful and well-known venture capitalists in the country um, who has a podcast that I follow wrote, uh, figure on 10 years. Um, and um, certainly for an earlier stage venture deal, uh, that ought to be your horizon. The good news is, if it's done through a self-directed IRA, well, that's the perfect vehicle to hold that investment, depending on when in your life you're investing. Obviously, if you're closer to distributions from your IRA, then perhaps venture capital is is not the not the flavor for you. But if you're younger and you're building that portfolio and you've got that kind of timeline, then then certainly um, I would encourage you to look at it. So at this point, then I think I'll dive into. Uh, what I call seven questions. And the idea here is with these seven questions, um, you can get a good general sense of what a company is about. They're going to seem basic and they are. But um, what I find is when you're in, confronted with a company to evaluate it, human nature is to, well, the human, the human nature of yourself is you tend to dwell on maybe the more positive aspects of the deal. And of course, from the company that needs the capital and is presenting the transaction, they're naturally going to accentuate or, or emphasize those elements of their story that are the strongest. What you need to come away with is a balanced um, understanding of the business. And that's partly seven questions is, is kind of a, discipl a discipline that at least makes sure you cover the waterfront. So the first question sounds pretty basic. What do you do? You, the company. Um, believe it or not, over my decades now of doing this, you you know, it's not at all unusual for a company not to be able to clearly state what they do. And the deeper in technology you get, um, the more this is the case. So, um, you know, if they can't explain to you clearly what they're doing, I think it's fair to say that they're going to have a hard time telling customers, and I'll get to customers in a minute, their customers, what they do. And, um, and why is it needed? The why of this company? Um, there's some opportunity out there that's created by a customer. And are they creating something that responds to that need? And then fundamentally, um, is this the new, new thing to uh, to quote a book put out years ago by Michael Lewis um, around venture capital? Or is this making something that currently exists better? Uh, the new, new thing can be a, a wonderful way to make a lot of money if they're successful. But by its nature, it's a harder sell to, to customers because people don't know what it is. It has to be explained. Um, if, it's, if it's an improvement, well, then it's going to be a more competitive environment. So first question, what do you do? The second question is, who are you? And, and the, the parties that are asking you for your money um, and to make an investment, by right, should have, an have background that correlate to the industry that they're in. Um, no disrespect to art history majors, but there probably aren't many art history majors who, you know, have a background in um, computer chip design um, or um, some medical technology field. So what you would hope is that, one, they're leveraging experience they have, and that's where they saw the market opportunity. And then they can also leverage customer relationships they might bring. Um, 
and you, you also want to be somewhat mindful of management because no person can do it on their own. So can they build a team? Can they command? Can they manage the team? Uh, and then finance experience. I want to I want to emphasize that a bit. Um, beware of the entrepreneur who says once you start asking them about the numbers, well, I don't do that. That's my CFO. Uh, I'm strongly of the view that you know an entrepreneur that doesn't understand a basic level of accounting, well, he's not going to understand cash flow. He's not going to understand you know, run budgets with expenses. And if you're going along for the ride a bit here as an equity investor, let's say for a venture deal, then um, you have to ask yourself, are they, how do they know the value that they're building for you as an equity investor? Or if you're if you're a debt investor, likewise, do they really understand their cash flow sufficient that they know they can meet debt service? And then operating track record. Um, there's a lot to be said for Experience, relevant experience. And um, while I'm not a big fan of uh, saluting failure, um, I'm also not in the camp that says because someone's failed, they necessarily should be disregarded for their next for their next transaction. There's a lot of wisdom that comes from failure and so or at least adversity. So who are these people? And, you know, are they really the kind of people that you want to get behind, frankly, if for whatever reason you don't, your your spidey sense is telling you you may not trust them, run the other way. Um, listen to your gut. If you don't have a comfortable sense with these people, um, there's always another deal. You, you should move on. Because once you've written the check, um, well, you're an investor. Getting your money back is a lot harder than putting it in if you have the funds to begin with. Where yeah, are you? Uh, I'm just curious. What are some real basic things that you ask for, you know, obviously as you're doing your research. So when you're looking into their background, just some real <laughs> basic things, you know, <laughs> to kind of verify the background that you're looking for. Well, the most basic thing we do is a criminal background check <laughs> and a liens yeah. and judgment search. So we have learned over the years to pay up for the database searches that allow us to get a more in-depth view. Um, there's some other products, there's products like Truthfinder that we've used. Um, we're not above uh, looking at someone's home uh, independently to see if that matches up to what they tell us about their level of success and background. Um, but but at a basic level, uh, you would probably be surprised how many times we've looked into someone's background and found they have a criminal background. Um, and uh, in one case, probably the classic was uh, the CFO for this company when we did our research we found a court testimony where he had sued his prison warden uh, during an earlier stint in prison for securities fraud uh, because the prison warden wouldn't let him order Domino's pizza. So oh, you, you yeah. can't make up some of the things we were. You know, these are human beings, right? So you can't yeah. make up some of the things you run into. But I think on a more subtle level, uh, in liens and judgment searches, getting a sense of someone's personal credit history. Um, and, and and these are not the kind of things that the average uh, high net worth investor is going to be able to do on their own. So you're probably going to need the support of either a law firm or obviously a firm like ourselves. All the deals we bring are subject to this. Um, but, you know, if they have a significant amount of personal debt, um, that could be a real you may wonder, is that going to be an impediment to them thinking objectively about the business if they have significant tax liens? Um, likewise, you know, their, their pay, their paychecks are going to get garnished, et cetera. So, um, we also do third party reference checks. So we do our best to speak to, um, uh, to references, both the ones that they've provided and others that we can dream up. Um, <laughs> sure. obviously few people will give you a, a poor personal reference. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I would tell you maybe the research on the individuals is the most important thing you can do because if you're investing in someone who's not whose interests are completely misaligned with your own or at the very least at a personal level they're not inclined to honor the obligations they're making to you when you buy their security uh you're in trouble um there's there's no document you can put in place even though lawyers will document these deals to the nth degree um if the person really is not intent on honoring the financial transaction that they've committed to when you buy their security, um, 
you know, you're going to have a real challenge on this deal. You'll probably fail. Um, does that help? Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the where are you question is really one of stage. I define venture stage as a company that has not achieved operating cash flow and operating cash flow equals sustainability. So if it's a venture stage deal, you need to be very mindful of whether of just what are they losing every month? How far would the investment that you're taking put them? In our case, when we raise money for a venture stage company, and we've done over 400 million of it, um, there's a good chance that the money we're raising is not going to get that company to positive cash flow. We do tend to prioritize maybe somewhat less sexy venture deals that can get to cash flow uh, from operations from the money we raise. But there's equally in the venture world a good chance, particularly if you're early stage, that your investment's not going to get them there. Well, the question is, you know, how long will it take them? What are they going to achieve in that period of time? Will it should it generate value so that the next venture round is at a higher valuation so that effectively, even though it's on paper, you're rewarded somewhat for the investment you're made, at least in terms of a paper gain. Um, and and I will say the more mature these companies get, uh, the, the easier they are to finance. So um, while I've not read about it anywhere, I can tell you our experience has been the venture capital community per se gets interested when a company has five million or more revenue. Um, you would think by the name venture capital that they would be earlier stage. And if if the entrepreneur has made money for a venture capital firm, there is some good chance that the fund the fund may come in earlier, whether the fund or their or their partners. But you know, depending on where you are in the country, unless you happen to be active in the angel community in Silicon Valley or very few other places, but nothing like Silicon Valley, um, you really you know liquidity risk is something you need to be very sensitive to. So. Um, are they selling a product now? Uh, a great litmus test of the viability of a product is whether some third party has parted with their money to buy it. And they're, you know, op entrepreneurs uh, are optimistic by nature. Um, and understanding, you know, and we'll talk again about customers in the next slide, but are they making something and selling it? And even if they're not generating as an enterprise positive cash flow, the fact that they've now defined a customer base that's willing to pay for what they've got, whether that's a retail customer base around a consumer product or whether that's more of a business to business um, uh, transaction where you've got a, a company buying their product. And again, we'll speak to that in the middle. And then, then lastly, do they have revenue at all? Do they have positive cash flow? And do they have profitability? And those are actually three different things. When you get into profitability, you're starting to talk about non-cash expense. Um, but when you're into in, in cash flow, by and large, is EBITDA, which tends to be the basis for valuing companies. So, but you know, where do they stand? It's a real simple question. Um, uh, is, is there any revenue being generated? How much? How diverse is the customer base? Has it actually progressed to a scale that it actually they can run the business without raising more money? Uh, that's obviously a safer phase for you as an investor to get in. So, all right. Um, this is arguably my favorite slide and arguably, in my opinion, the hardest thing about business for a young company. Uh, who's your customer? Um, it's, it's, it's really, if there's not a sharp customer focus, a deep understanding of that customer and why they would buy the product then you know this is going to be a real adventure <laughs> because they're trying to figure it out on the fly and they're trying to figure it out with your money um in my mind this is right up at the top obviously it's question number four you can't really ask this question if you've asked the first three but they have to know who their customers are and equally important they have to know what motivates their customers to buy the product so you know for example we've just come out of probably the penultimate um customer sales situation through COVID, where you know the, the whole planet was concerned about getting their hands on a vaccine, and as quickly as the pharmaceutical companies could come out with one, they they there's a lot of shortcuts that were put in place to get that customer out, um, uh, you know, to to the consumer. And I'm not questioning that, but what drove that pace of that sale was fear. Um, contrast that to buying a new car, which you know often is not as an impulse buy. Uh, but it's certainly a purchase that you can put off for a day or a week or a month, or in my case, years. 
Um, I drive old cars. Um, and and there's nothing wrong with with a, a, a transaction or a, a product that's bought based on value, but you just need to know that it's a discretionary purchase. And so what drives that purchase is going to be uh, a lot of subjective things. Um, we have to do a reasonable amount of finance in the beauty industry. And obviously that's in the eye of the beholder. Um, it it kind of gets back though to the, the, that is a good example of getting to this last last point. And it's also a good way to kind of emphasize maybe a way of thinking about customers that isn't intuitive. So we have a beauty, a beauty client. Um, they've been in business over 10 years. Uh, they happen to sell a product that deals with enhancing eyebrows. And since the Kardashians came along, eyebrows have been hot. Um, and so they have a whole product line for eyebrows. Um, and the first part of this cost, the first part of our experience with them, and we've been with them 10 years, was a direct to consumer sale. And in their case, uh, they would do it on their website um, and they would you know, do different marketing through social media to drive traffic to their website. Um, where they're really finding success, however, is where they create a new service line for, in this case, spas um, and spas with salons in them. And so when you go back to who is the customer, well, certainly the customer at the end of the day is going to be that retail customer and whether they're satisfied with the product. In the case of a spa, they would give a service, but then they would have um uh, promotional displays where if the customer liked the product, they could do a retail sale as well. They could, the spa can sell them a product. It's another way for them to generate revenue off to that customer interaction. But when you start to look at that particular situation, you've got a B to B to C transaction on your hands. First, you've got to get the spa owner to say, yep, I want to do that and I want your product. And then you've got to get the, the business owner set up so they can sell the product to, to use the product on their customer who's sitting in the chair, and then by extension, sell that product to a consumer. So this whole question of who your consumer, who your customer is, look carefully when they tell you that, because you really have to ask yourself, who's making the buy decision? Is it really the end use customer or is there an interim step there? So, okay. Let's go to slide number five. How's the product created? Now, this tends to be where most, most people spend their time in getting to know a company is how do they do what they do? And it's not unimportant. Uh, and it certainly needs to be looked at critically in terms of do they have the expertise? Do they have the amount of infrastructure to do it? PP&E, property, plant, equipment. How much capital will it take? Is there regulation involved? Um, is there intellectual property if it's venture stage? Intellectual property takes a tends to take a much more important role in this. Um, but you know, once you've kind of understand what they do, once you under know who they are, once you know who their customer is, now you can kind of figure out, well, how are they going to do this? Okay. And again, not unimportant, but if you go right to this, you're probably not going to have a lot of context for the questions you might ask. This is one that may seem obvious to most people, but you would be shocked how often, how, how, how seldom rather. The question is asked directly, how do you make money? Different products have different inherent margins. Margin being the difference between what you sell it for and what it costs to make it. You know, what's left is your margin. I won't get into an accounting class on gross margin versus net margin, but suffice to say, if you start as simple as, what are you selling it for and what's it cost to make it? Well, if it, if it costs more to make it than you're getting selling it, you're probably not gonna make it up on volume. So, um, I would argue, I would also say, I, I think an investment everyone should make who's even considering this is do take an accounting 101 class. You don't need 102. You don't need 201. Basic 101. What's a balance sheet? What's an income statement? A general sense of what cash flow is so that you know the difference between revenue and profits. They're very different. Revenue is that what someone sells the product for in the aggregate for their company. Um, profit is what's left over. And that in the case of profit, it's after non-cash expenses like depreciation and amortization. But, you know, as I said earlier, when you ask this question of the entrepreneur, if if they immediately deflect it to someone else, I think that's a red flag. And I just I, I think if, if the person running the business doesn't really understand the margins of their business, 
uh, or what's going to drive value. And, and I will say, in some cases, there are companies that are being built to sell, and they may never actually achieve profitability because they elect to put to continue to spend in sales because they have this opportunity to grow their top line. And, and in terms of creating equity value, that's a better way to go. They can always take their foot off the gas and generate cash flow. But if they even think that way is something you need to know. So that's my, that's, I guess, my, my basic point. Um, you know, critical mass, uh, how big do they need to get to be profitable? And capacity utilization, you know, the best analogy, it, when it works for almost any business, is a hotel. Um, hotels tend to make money when they've got at least 60% occupancy. And, and in some cases, you know, it's, it's a little bit higher than that. Um, so when you're looking at a company and its sales, where does it reach a point of throughput, if you will, where it can start really generating the additional cash? Because what happens is it's got fixed cost. Uh, that would be the salaries of all the employees, your full-time employees. And um, um, how big does it need to get before it's generating incremental cash? Uh, the other side of it, of course, is tax. Um, and, you know, everyone's tax situation is going to be a bit different. If you're in a self-directed IRA, you're obviously looking to shield the transaction from tax. So maybe it's not as important to you uh, in to the extent that it's profitable because you're going to defer the, that tax treatment. But you, you did, you know, in all likelihood, you're going to be as an equity holder. Uh, if you're, say, getting a K-1 from an LLC, you're going to be generating losses. Um, but uh, again, if you're in a self-directed IRA, all that's kind of deferred for another day. And then the last one, again, another favorite of mine, how are you going to get your money back? Um, there's four paths you can look at, and it's different for debt than for equity. Um, debt is what we call a, a, a fixed income investment, meaning there's going to be a certain maturity and there's going to be a certain interest rate associated with it, some type of amortization. And those are obligations of the company to pay on some schedule that's been determined. And in your analysis, you do need to figure out, is that a reasonable schedule for that for that company to pay? We have done many transactions where it's interest only for a while while the company can scale some more. And then we put amortization later on in the transaction where they begin to pay back the debt. I would say um, you um, be careful um, the bullet maturity. <laughs> bullet maturity is is basically one where all of the principal comes due at maturity because that's a tremendous liquidity risk. It begs the question, where's that company going to, where's the cash going to come for to pay back the debt? And um, much more often than not, it, it has to come from a refinancing, which means you're taking refinancing risk of whether they can come back with that. But the four paths you can get your money back on, cash flow, if they're generating a healthy amount of cash and you juxtapose that to the debt service associated with your investment, well, that can work. Refinancing is the one I just spoke to, and that's one where, okay, at some point in the future, they're going to refi the deal. This is quite common, of course, in real estate. And then, okay, the refinancing proceeds are first, if you're a debt holder, going to be used to repay your debt because presumably you have some collateral interest in the property, let's say, if it's real estate or another collateral, if it's an operating company. Um, they can sell the business, um, and, and sales of the business is why is how most equity investment in this day and age sees liquidity. Um, the problem with the fourth point, IPO, is, as I say here in underline, you need a big idea at the right time. Um, chances are, if you launched an internet service provider in 2024, it's a very different story than if you launched an internet service provider in 1995. Um, or some social media site, um, you know, what we tend to find in, in, in American, you know, capitalism is consolidation happens relatively quickly. And at the end of the day, you tend to have relatively few, um, few winners. But, you know, if you're investing in venture, you're coming in earlier. But the, the point is, I wouldn't go into a deal that you have to get through an IPO to get liquidity. I, I would look at transactions where the one they're going to generate enough cash to pay you back or refinancing is a reasonable assumption for this company to make. Or in the case of equity in particular, um, it's a business that's being built to sell to sell. And that's the case for for most technology investments is uh, uh, whether it's medical technology or information technology. Um, 
I guess, you know, the the other question that that I would point to is, and this is maybe, Chris, if you'll have us back a conversation for another day, um, is we have a concept that we call the lane. And, and the lane is our tool to understand the essence of a business. So what really is fundamentally the product, op the customer opportunity that's been created? What's the solution in the terms of a product or service that the company's created? And when you look at it that way, it leaves you with two types of challenges the company has to face. One is challenges to make the product or deliver the service. But the other one is the, pro the challenge relate to customers. And that can be everything from how big is the market to how competitive is the market to how does the customer make decisions? Is it individually? Is it by committee? Um, is it on a schedule? If it's a business, is it on some schedule? Um, what are the logistical issues? We tend to under invest, if you will, when looking at a deal in the customer challenges, because I can tell you after almost 30 years of doing this, um, I can count on very few, if any, fingers the number of times that a company's actually hit their financial projections. It was a venture stage business. It's the hardest thing I, I know of in business is to is to sell the new, new thing to a new, new customer. And um, so whatever projections you're handed, you should at least cut them in half and probably extend them by twice and then figure out if you know the value creation for that deal works for you. So I know some of this sounds negative. Uh, we've had plenty of success, but um, you're going to be faced with an unlimited number of investment options when you're in this private world. And so the question is, you know, which ones really, I think with this framework, you know, past muster, I would tell you every company has some hair on it, if you will. No company that I know of is perfect. Um, so it becomes a relative value measure. Um, I, I think it also follows that if you're going to be in this in this in this world and um, you need to see as many deals as you can so that you can get a relative sense of the value of one deal versus another. And um, and that's not easy. Um, I do think if you find others in your community who are successful with this or otherwise you happen to know, leveraging their expertise is a good way to go. It's also a good way to to address some liquidity issues um, without sounding too self-serving. This is what Carafin does. So we give you a chance to see deals on an ongoing basis and pick the ones that, that you like. And then, you know, we get your understanding of the deal to a certain point. And then, you know, no questions off the table. You can you can ask us more questions and we'll if we haven't addressed that issue and we certainly don't know everything, then that helps us dig a little deeper in an area that we might not have thought of. But um, I will say, I guess I'll leave my little piece of this at, at, at this point. Um, our tagline for our company is uh, meaningful investments, vital capital. The direct private investment world lets you pick and choose the transactions that you want to invest in. And meaningful is is for you to determine. Um, it could be something in your family uh, that that is a history that in the private sector, there's a way for you to not just contribute to that area. And I think of something like, for example, addiction treatment. We've done a fair amount of investment uh, over the years in that sector. And this becomes a way for you to invest in companies who are trying to deliver better, better care um, and make money on it um, so that you can then reinvest that. If you want, give that away to some cause that you might have there. You know, there's an unlimited number of places you can go. But uh, vital capital is really speaking to um, the nature of the finance that we're doing. Uh, as I said before, Commercial banking, as many of us older guys like myself would would remember, has changed irrevocably. I would argue, um, we'll never probably have the day of the, the the local commercial banker who would make loans that in today's world you would look like venture capital to start a business. Those days are over. Uh, by the same token, the venture capital industry, such as it is, for the most part, is out of the reach of most entrepreneurs, far and away most entrepreneurs. And so, if you look at how the American economy has been created, it, it by and large has been individuals who've chosen to make direct investments um, that turned into successful ventures. And you can go all the way back to whaling in Nantucket in the 1700s. You can look at the uh, furniture and the uh, textile industries in New England when they started off, all the way through to um, um, some of the biggest tech companies today started with individuals that made those investments. So 
um, obviously I've created, you know, I'm, I'm, we're very supported, supportive, and, and it's a big part of our world, and we look forward to helping anybody we can uh, make it part of theirs. So thank you. Yeah, well, Bruce, we certainly appreciate your time. And if you wouldn't have mind uh, advancing just a little bit, I wanted to leave folks ah. with just a little bit of, yeah, information about Carafin. And thank you for sharing, by the way, uh, the Knowledge Center on your website. I think that could be a valuable tool for folks in addition to some of the things that we uh, spoke of. And if we'll go one more slide forward, I think we just have some contact information. And so folks, as you're listening to this, if you had questions that came to mind, uh, whether it's about self-directed IRA or maybe a little dig a little deeper with Carafin and how they evaluate whether it's debt or equity, uh, it sounds like you look at both situations. Uh, we would encourage you to reach out and, and get some of those questions answered. Uh, Bruce, thank you very much. That was uh, very informative, and it sounds like <laughs> that was scratching the surface a little bit. So we, we may need to circle back and uh, dig a little deeper at some point. Well, we, we, we really appreciate the opportunity to do that. And again, thanks to you and and a new direction for, for letting us have this uh this chance to, to to make this presentation. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, folks, by all means, reach out if you do have any questions. There's some contact information there. And uh, we hope you have a wonderful day. Take care now.